Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug and welcome to my 10 minute review of AP Chemistry Unit 1, which covers atomic structure and properties. If you find this video useful, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, leave a comment, and share this video with your AP Chemistry classmates and colleagues. And don't forget to check out my complete AP Chemistry course playlist right here on YouTube that gets right to the point of all 91 topics in the course. Now, let's review Unit 1. You have to be able to convert from moles to grams and vice versa. To do this, use the atomic mass for an element, or for a compound, the sum of the atomic masses of the atoms in the compound. For example, to convert 10.00 grams of carbon dioxide to moles, you'll use dimensional analysis. In your conversion factor, put one mole on top, 44.01 grams on bottom, which is 12.01 plus 16.00 plus 16.00. And when you divide, you get an answer of 0.2272 moles. You should also be able to convert particles to moles. There are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd teeny tiny particles in a mole. Atoms, molecules, ions, whatever it happens to be for that substance. So if you have those 0.2272 moles of carbon dioxide, you can convert to molecules by putting one mole on the bottom of your conversion factor and 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules on the top. When you cancel out the units and multiply, you get 1.368 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Another skill is being able to interpret a mass spectrum graph for an element. For example, a graph like this shows the relative abundance of the isotopes of the element that's being analyzed. So we have two isotopes. One of them has a mass of 107 atomic mass units, and the other one has a mass of 109 atomic mass units. The 107 isotope is more abundant. About 52% of all the atoms of this element have a mass of 107, while about 48% have a mass of 109. We can do some quick math and estimate that the average atomic mass of this element would be right around 108, maybe a tad less than that. So we can look at the periodic table and confidently say that this is the graph for silver. You need to be able to do that for any element's mass spec graph that you might be given on the exam. You should be able to determine an empirical formula from a compound's composition data. An empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio formula for a compound. It's like taking a formula and reducing it down to lowest terms. So for example, the molecular formula for oxalic acid is H2C2O4, but its empirical formula is HCO2. If we have a substance that contains 40.05% sulfur and 59.95% oxygen by mass, we would express those percents as grams, like we show here. Then, convert both of those masses to moles using those elements' respective atomic masses. Then, when we get the moles, we divide each of them by the smallest of those values. These are the relative subscripts of the elements, so the 1 and 3 tell us that the empirical formula is SO3. Now, the law of definite proportions tells us that every sample of SO3 sulfur trioxide, no matter where it comes from, will always have that same proportion, 40.05% sulfur and 59.95% oxygen. You need to understand that mixtures are not the same as pure substances. Often in the lab, we're asked to analyze a sample that has a certain substance we're interested in. Let's say it's potassium chloride. Now that sample might have some other impurities in it. We can weigh the sample, dissolve it in water, then analyze how much potassium or how much chloride is in there using a variety of methods. If we're asked to compare samples containing multiple chlorides, such as a few different vials containing lithium chloride, sodium chloride, aluminum chloride, and who knows what else, our key here is to focus on the chloride because it's the ion they have in common. And if you have a sample of sodium chloride, you can calculate its percent mass and see that a pure sample of sodium chloride should be about 61% chloride. If the sample is only 20% chloride, then you know that the sodium chloride only makes up about one-third of what it would be if it were a pure sample. 
That means you have about two-thirds of the sample making up impurities. We're halfway through, so I want to let you know that if you like these fast review videos, then you're going to love my ultimate review packet for AP Chemistry. And as my gift to every one of you, I'm making all of my Unit 1 materials free so you can try out the packet and see if it's for you. I'm going to give you an extended 30-minute unit summary video, a study guide with lots of practice problems, all the answers, uh, multiple choice practice, a key concepts worksheet to put everything together, along with my exclusive tips and tricks for Unit 1. Just head over to ultimatereviewpacket.com, click on AP Chemistry, and then click on Free Preview. Now, back to the review. One of the key skills in understanding atomic structure is being able to write electron configurations for the elements. For example, the electron configuration for scandium would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d1. You need to be very good at writing these. You also need to recognize that the electrons in the outermost electron shell are called valence electrons. In scandium, there are two of those. The S, P, and D represent sublevels or, or, or subshells, and there are seven total subshells in scandium. If we're trying to compare the forces holding the electrons to the nucleus, we use Coulomb's law. Essentially, Coulomb's law states that there are two factors, charge and distance, when comparing the force holding two charged particles together. The greater the charge, the stronger the attractive force. The lower the charge, the weaker the attractive force. The greater the distance between the charged particles, the weaker the attractive force. And the closer the distance between the particles, the stronger the attractive force. So that means that the electrons that are farthest away from the nucleus, those valence electrons, have the weakest attraction to the nucleus. So they're the ones that can be removed the easiest. And these core electrons, the ones that are closest to the nucleus, are most difficult to remove. You can identify an atom using photoelectron spectroscopy. If you can write an electron configuration, you can interpret a PES graph like this. All you have to do is label the peaks from left to right with the sublevels in increasing energy. So 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and 4s. And the relative heights of the peaks correspond to the number of electrons in each sublevel. So all these s sublevels each have two electrons, since they're all the same height. And these two are three times taller, so they must have six electrons each. So you can look at this and see that it ends with 4s2, so that means it has to be calcium. Several trends in atomic properties can be predicted by looking at the periodic table. For example, ionization energy and electronegativity generally increase as you move to the right and top of the periodic table and they decrease as you move toward the left and bottom of the table. Atomic radius is the opposite. Atoms are smaller toward the top and right of the periodic table, and they're the largest toward the bottom and left. The periodic table helps predict these trends, but they do not explain them. Generally speaking, if you're asked for an explanation comparing atoms that are across from each other, left and right, their differences are due to a greater effective nuclear charge on the right and lower effective nuclear charge on the left. When comparing atoms that are above or below each other, their differences are due to a greater distance of valence electrons from the nucleus toward the bottom of the table and a lower distance from the valence electrons to the nucleus for the atom at the top of the table. When you're looking at ions, generally speaking, the more positively charged an ion is, the smaller it is. And the more negatively charged the ion is, the larger it will be. That's because of Coulomb's law. An ion with more electrons than protons will allow the electrons to repel each other and will be larger. An ion with more protons than electrons will have that nucleus pulling in those electrons as tightly as possible. 
you need to be comfortable with the number of valence electrons in atoms and how this affects the compounds they form. There are specific patterns that help us see how many valence electrons an atom has. And as you can see here, the group that an element is in tells us how many valence electrons it has. The octet rule helps us to predict the charge that ions of these atoms will have. So ions from group 1 tend to have a plus 1 charge. Group 2 will be plus 2, and group 13 will be plus 3. Ions from group 17 tend to take a negative 1 charge. Group 16 will be negative 2, and group 15 will be negative 3. So an ionic compound made up of magnesium and chloride will have plus 2 and negative 1 charges. So its formula would be MgCl2. And likewise, aluminum has a plus 3 charge, while sulfide has a negative 2 charge. So the formula for aluminum sulfide will be Al2S3. Well, that was about 10 minutes, and that's Unit 1 over Atomic Structure and Properties. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.